What good are these for so many? With these words, the Apostle Andrew succinctly summarizes the human condition. The needs of the world are many, and I have little to offer. It is hard for us to see how a few loaves of bread can take care of the hunger of a crowd, let alone the hunger of a world. It is hard for us to see how a kind word here or there can contribute to peace in our communities, let alone world peace. Focusing only on our poverty and limitations, we may feel like simply giving up. Or we may seek out someone we perceive as powerful, a king, a president, a billionaire, to whom we can hand off the problems of the world. Of course, experience shows that they too are likely to come up short when it comes to big problems, especially if they think they can do it alone. But both strategies, giving up or pointing the finger to someone else, miss the point of today's readings. In our first reading from the book, second book of Kings, the prophet Elisha receives a generous gift of 20 loaves of fresh barley bread. Since barley bread was the traditional bread of the poor, it is understandable that Elisha's first response was to share it with the people. This draws a skeptical response from Elisha's portion control minded servant. But Elisha demonstrates what can happen when human generosity is combined with divine intervention. Everyone is fed, and there are leftovers beside. For our gospel, you might have noticed that we've shifted from our usual cycle B reading from the Gospel of Mark to the Gospel of John. The reason is fairly simple. The Gospel of Mark is simply not long enough to fill all the Sundays of ordinary time. So rather than try to spread out Mark's rather succinct account of the feeding of the 5,000, for the next several weeks, we will hear John's account of what is known as the Bread of Life Discourse. I wonder if anyone else finds it the least amusing or perhaps ironic that we will be multiplying words in tandem with Jesus multiplying loaves of bread. Putting that aside, John's account was clearly intended to reference our first reading about Elisha, since both are serving barley bread. At the same time, Jesus is demonstrating even more dramatically his desire to care for us by feeding thousands from only five loaves of bread. More importantly, the sign Jesus works for the crowd is the same sign he wishes to work in our lives. With gratitude and blessing, Jesus wishes to multiply our efforts and our offerings, as inadequate as they may be or seem. Jesus invites us to allow God to transform our limited and imperfect efforts by his unlimited and perfect love. Of course, we believe that God could simply fix everything by himself, but God wants us to participate in the ongoing work of transformation and creation. Thus, when the crowd misses the point of today's sign, they want to make Jesus a king, and he withdraws from them. Perhaps you will recall the story of the saintly woman who, having reached her senior years, prayed each night that God would let her win the lottery. As more and more days went by without anything coming her way, her prayers became more fervent. Then one night she heard a voice from heaven, Give me a break. Buy a ticket. <laughs> the point of the story is not to encourage gambling, 
but rather to remind us that God wants our faith to be practical, not magical. According to God's plan, the transformation of the world will take place as we allow God to bless and multiply our efforts and offerings. Next weekend, we will celebrate the feast of St. Ignatius of Loyola, who, along with his companions, founded the Society of Jesus, the Jesuits. Early in his life, Ignatius dreamed of doing great things, first for a noble lady and then for God. As his life unfolded, he ended up doing fairly simple things with great regularity as he sought to help souls. While he and his companions are often thought of as having achieved great things, thanks to numerous Jesuit biographers, Ignatius understood that the praise really belonged to God, who was blessing and multiplying his humble efforts. This weekend, at the request of Pope Francis, we are celebrating the first Grandparents and Elders Day. As I mentioned at the beginning of Mass, I've chosen to use the word elders, which I think is closer to what Pope Francis had in mind as he invites us to be grateful for those who have helped to guide us in life, rather than elderly, which has some connotations in English that many grandparents would prefer to overlook. In any event, those of us who have been blessed to know our grandparents can probably recall their numerous simple acts of unconditional love, acts that have inspired us to follow their example. In his letter to the Ephesians, St. Paul urges us to live our lives in a manner worthy of the call we have received. He invites us to offer our daily lives to God. We may wonder what good will come of our humility, our gentleness, our patience, our love, in the midst of a world that is beset by pride and arrogance, impatience and indifference. What good are these for so many? Left to themselves and by themselves, they may in fact make little difference. But if we allow them to be blessed and multiplied by God, they will make all the difference in the world and there will be leftovers beside.